The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Another parable Jesus put before the crowds. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds. But when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid, and in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Bow your heads with me in prayer, please. Gracious Lord, we give you great thanks for this day that you have created and allowed us to share. Lord, would you take our minds and think through them? Take my lips and speak through them? Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your son, Jesus. Take our wills and put them in submission to yours. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning again. I uh, don't like being unofficial, but I did take my alb off today because it was really, really hot this morning and I was sweating without it and I thought, you know what, it's time. So um, I don't like doing it, but the sweat made me do it. I want to begin with a quote from C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, one of my favorite books. This is from his chapter on hope. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. I'll read that first sentence again. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. I had a bit of this feeling recently, a month ago, as I was planning for vacation, that feeling inside of me that I really needed a break, that I needed something else, that I needed a different experience because I was done. Those of you who saw or knew me about six or seven weeks ago, I was fried. I was beat up. I had no energy left. I was cranky. Bethany, thank you. Um, it was just rough, and I needed a vacation, and I had that kind of seed of it's time to go. I have this satisfying need to get on and find some peace and rest. And about seven or eight months ago into November, December, the family decided to go to the Outer Banks, and so that seed was planted. We love going to the Outer Banks. I've been going there my whole life. It just brings me peace and refreshment. And then COVID came, and we weren't sure for a couple months whether we were going to go, and my family decided we Zoomed and all talked about, you know, is it possible? Can we do it? And we did it. We decided we're going for it. And so now we're three months out, two months out, and that seed of hopeful expectation is really starting to germinate. It's getting me really excited, especially because each day, each week, I was getting tired and tired and tired, and I knew I'm getting there. Just drag me, drag me to the vacation. And then it was a month, and then it was a week, and then it was the day before, and I started packing the car, and I don't know how you are on, on road trips. If you go on a road trip and you have this destination, you've got these things you want to take with you, or if it's a vacation, and, or even if it's just to go down somewhere peaceful and restful, maybe it's a park, or maybe it's to a friend's house. But when you go on a road trip, more often than not, you pack the car, and you prep it. And those of you who go on long excursions, especially if you have a two-year-old like I do, there's a lot of things to consider. 
And so we prep the car for whatever might happen, good or bad. So there's food and water for Bethany and I. There's a bag of toys and two bags of books and food and diaper bag, everything that Owen would need. There's music for both Bethany and I to listen to because when you're driving on 95, you probably want to blow something up sometimes if you don't have some calming music because the traffic is crazy. So there's music. And most of that's, you know, needful, useful things. But I always, when I go on long road trips or vacations, I also prepare for the worst, just in case, because everything isn't, you know, sunshine and roses. So I bring my flashlight in case we break down at night, and I bring, you know, the spare tire and, the, and the, all the tools you need to fix that. I used to, I don't do this anymore, I used to travel with a knife in my car and a tent in case I broke down in the middle of the woods and had to protect myself, because you never know. I was a Boy Scout just long enough to know I have to be prepared for anything. And this is that journey where you don't know, you're driving 700 miles in the middle of the summer, anything could go wrong. Car could run out of gas or break down or some silly bad driver from New York, yes, you know who you are, could do something on the road or there could be crazy construction or I don't know, anything could happen. So we had to prepare for that. We had to prep for that. And then it was the day of and we got out got in the car about 11.30. I mean, yeah, we were supposed to leave at nine, but it's okay, we're still on the way. And that seed of expectation, that hope is building because now I'm in the car, I'm on the way, and we get going and it's glorious and I'm on my way to vacation and I'm leaving old Saybrook and I love all the people, but I'm ready for vacation. And then Owen throws up in the car, our first major setback. Now, those of you who from Grace Church know a couple years ago we had a George Washington Bridge problem. We solved that. We go up to the Tappan Zee. We don't deal with that anymore. But we got right to that same area and Owen started throwing up because we were in stop and go traffic. <sighs> well, I had prepped it for it. We had bags and, and we had paper towels and we cleaned it up, but it was, it was a big mess. And it was, oh man, is this going to how the next 700 miles are going to be? And we kept going. We spent a night and it got a little better along the road. You know, we actually made it past New York and into Baltimore, we spent a night with a friend, and then the next day, we actually made it through D.C. without any craziness, we're, we're passing Richmond, nothing crazy, you know, we're enjoying the beauty of the scenery and the surrounding, and then we get down to the tip of North Carolina, and you cross that first bridge, and you can see the ocean, and then, and you see the trees, and then there's signs, and you know you're almost there. The crab shack, kite surfing, the sand dunes. And that hopeful expectation is starting to really bubble. Now I know. And you come around this last bend and there's big pine trees and all of a sudden the pine trees disappear. And you first see those first immediate sand dunes. And you can see the sand along the road and you know now I'm at the beach. You pull into that first area of Kill Devil Hills and Nags Head and you're there. Eight months of that waiting and excitement and hope is, is really, really, it's almost there. You can start to smell the salt. Now we have, uh, we go, usually when we go, we go down real far south. So we have another 45 minutes to drive, but that 45 minutes is like that. Because I'm there. That I'm on the Outer Banks and the, the house is whatever. I don't care if it's two hours now, it's nothing. After all of that, ups and downs of the whole journey, the preparation, the long ride, and the two-year-old, and all that. And then we get to that last area and the sign for our little town shows up and you know you're home and then you pull into the driveway, you turn off the car and you get out barefoot and you step on the sand in the driveway. And we're right on the beach so you can hear the waves crashing and you can hear those summer crickets. And I can not only smell the salt water, I can taste it in my mouth and that hopeful expectation that has carried me for eight months, that carried me through all of the craziness of COVID and those last few weeks where I felt like I was just gonna run out of gas, it drove me literally to the Outer Banks, to this place, and now that hope and expectation has changed. It, it evaporates into peace and refreshment. And I realize I'm on vacation. Don't call me, don't text me, you're gonna be okay. And we go up the stairs, we start unloading the car, and there's that wonderful little moment where you walk into the house and there's this weird smell. It's like a saltwater smell mixed with air conditioning. I can't really explain it. It smells like vacation. 
And usually there's a cedar smell too, because a lot of those houses are made out of cedar. I don't know. It just means I'm there. And the hope has carried me to peace and refreshment and vacation. This passage from C.S. Lewis, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is I was made for another world. Probably these earthly pleasures weren't meant to satisfy it, but to arouse it and to suggest the real thing. This idea of us going on road trips or vacations, having a hopeful expectation that gets us to our destination, even though the travel is difficult, the journey is long and up and down and good and bad, we know that when we get there, I can see it, I can taste it, I can touch it, I can feel it, I can hear it. And that is reality has become reality right in front of me. Paul alludes to something very similar, but on a grander scale, of course, in his passage today in Romans chapter 8. Now, we had just heard, just a couple paragraphs earlier, the phrase that is good for some people and scary for others, the idea that this momentary affliction is not worth the weight of glory that is going to come. And here, today in our reading, in 26 through 39, he explains bigger, wider. What is he getting at? And it's this destination, it's this for me, this metaphor, this vacation journey metaphor. And there's three things that Paul is doing today. The first thing Paul does is, as Paul should and as Jesus did and the apostles should and as the church more often than not does, is remind us what? That the journey isn't just you get in your car, you go, and everything's fine. It's not roses and puppy dogs and whatever. Owen's puking, it's hot. The, the traffic is long, you're on 95, they should just blow that road up. I mean, it's terrible. Things are bad. Yeah, there's some beautiful scenery. Yeah, we get some family time. The journey is difficult, and so Paul doesn't shy from this, reminding us in these words in the passage, for we don't know how to pray as we ought. We're on a journey with Jesus, and Christians don't even know how to pray, he says. The one thing the world thinks we do all the time, and we don't even really know how to do it. We're in trouble. But he goes more than that. He says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? He's not listing these for fun. He's explaining the human predicament. He's truthfully letting you know that in the journey onto that destination that you're seeking, the peace and rest and refreshment, bad things happen. Terrible things happen. He doesn't shy from this. He even explains even more. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor present things, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he's basically saying nothing good or bad can separate you. Which means there, it's not just good. There's bad too. But it doesn't matter because in the end... It all works, as he says, for good. So this is Paul reminding us the journey really sometimes is just terrible. It's hard. Driving 700 miles in the summer through New York, Philly, Baltimore, D.C., and Richmond with a two-year-old, that's hard work. It's tough. It was not easy. It took two days. The destination, however. Now, along the way, we've prepped, right? We've prepped our car, we've prepared ourselves. There are things that we prepare for, good or bad. And number two thing he does here is that he boldly proclaims that even though we know that the journey is difficult and long and hard, as we're seeking that feeling, that experience, that destination, look what God has done. Look what God has done in his Son and through the Holy Spirit to prep you, to prepare you, and to go with you. He says this, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep, too deep for words. God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit. We can't pray? Guess who's going to pray for us? The Holy Spirit. You get tired? Guess who's going to strengthen you? The Holy Spirit. We know that all things, good and bad, work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those who he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. He didn't just call us into the car and say, go. He prepares us. He justifies us. And then he realizes at the end of the destination, you've gone through this whole thing, and it's been a mess, and it's been up and down. I'm going to glorify you. That's the moment of getting out of the car. 
That's the moment when the hopeful expectation transforms itself into peace and rest. It's the perfection of justification. It's glorification. God does this too. If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Not just the Holy Spirit, but Jesus Christ and the power intercedes us. And not just that. Jesus died so that the journey would be doable, so that the destination could be reached. Now, I love all of you. Even if I don't know you well, I love you. But I don't think I would sacrifice my only son for any of you. I just don't think I would. It's nothing personal. I'm human. I'm not Jesus. I'm not Abraham. I'm not putting him on a stack of wood and about to light it. I'm just not. You know? I just can't get there. But God did. God sacrificed his most precious thing, a part of himself, for us so that we could make the journey to strengthen us, to pray for us, to intercede for us. Know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. This is what God does. He preps the car. He prepares the car. He sets the GPS. He walks with us and strengthens us in the midst of the entire journey. Why? Why is, what's the purpose behind all this? And that's where Paul basically gives you this sense, this feeling. It's that hope. The purpose of all of this is to give you hope. The seed was planted in you by faith, and it grows in hope so that through this journey here, the metaphorical journey to our destination of vacation or whatever it is we're seeking, in the ups and downs, you will have hope. What, what got me through those last few weeks and all the way down the road through all the ups and downs on the way to the beach was hope that I was going to get out of that car and go, And that hope carried me there. But that hope did something else amazing as well. It gave me clarity of purpose. You see, all of us as human beings, rightfully so, have our things that we have to do. We have to live. We have to engage. We have to work. But we get so bogged down with that being the only thing that we forget the glory that awaits us. Climbing the corporate ladder, getting powerful and rich, getting all these extra degrees, buying all these things. Do we do that? Yes. Do we have to? I guess we do, but that's not our purpose. The purpose of the cross was to reconcile us to God the Father so that we could spend eternity with him in his home, in his kingdom. This is just the journey in the car. He's prepped us and prepared us, and he's driving with us, and he's saying, wait until you get to the destination. Can you wait just a little longer? This is your purpose, to be with me in my kingdom for eternity, where there is a peace that passes all understanding. And I ask each one of us, I've asked yesterday and this morning, and I ask now, were there not, are there not moments in your life where you were willing to go through anything to attain something, whether it's a degree or a test or a child or an opportunity or a job, and you went through terrible things to go through it? Maybe it was a medical condition. You had to take all these drugs, or you had to have a terrible surgery. You had to go through chemo. And you went through it with the hope leading you towards something better. Now take all of those into a basket and carry that to the truth. Because what God says is, I am giving you living hope in Jesus Christ so that you can keep on the journey because the destination is going to be so glorious you can't even, you can't even put it in words. We say heaven, we say kingdom of heaven, we say peace that passes understanding. We don't know. It's going to be more glorious than we can imagine. He says, you're on the journey. I'm with you. I'm interceding for you. I've sent my son to die for you. Here's your hope. Keep up the journey, because when you get to the end, you won't even be able to understand it. This is what Christ has done for us on the cross. This is what the Holy Spirit does with us each and every day. And I encourage each one of you to keep on that journey, trusting that the destination will be amazing. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.